I'm Kelvin Hepner with Real Agriculture and uh, pleased to be joined here at uh, CropSphere 2018 by Max Schulman, a farmer from Finland. And Max, why don't you tell us what you do and, and why you're here in Canada, what you're talking to Canadian farmers about uh, here at CropSphere. Yeah, happy to do that. Uh, thank you for asking. I mean, I'm an arable farmer from the southern part of Finland, but I'm also working as an advisor for the Finnish Farmers Union for the cereal, soil seeds and protein crops. But then I also have a job down in Brussels. I'm the chairman of the Arable Crops Working Group in Copacujica, taking care of cereals, oil seeds, and protein crops EU-wide. So I'm quite heavily involved, not only in the farming, that is my real job, as I would always say, but also in to what is happening on the legislational side, inside both Finland, but also EU. And that includes legislation and regulation in terms of pest control, weed control, and insect control in, in crops in, in Europe? Yes, everything that is related to the arable sector. And for sure today, I mean, also the chemistry, I mean, PPPs, pest control, weed control, all of these are for sure high on the list, as we have been able to find out as also here in Canada. Mm-hmm. But that is uh, daily life for us also over the pond in EU. So we've heard about uh, the restrictions on neonic use and the impact that that's had on, on canola or oilseed rape crops in, in Europe, uh, the recent glyphosate approval, those are some of the, I guess, the, the major issues that you've had to deal with? Yeah, those are just the beginning. That's like the top of the iceberg. We are seeing that there are more and more active substances being under pressure to be phased out. But I mean, these two big ones that you must also have been following here quite closely, that will also have an impact maybe even on some of your trade. But the neonics, there was a tremendous impact already on our oilseed rape, or what you would say here, the canola growing sector. We can see a drop already in yields, depending on from member state to member state, on a year-to-year basis, but in between 10 to 20% even in some. So that's for sure a big impact. But then the glyphosate might be the one that would impact you here in Canada maybe more, because it also has an impact on trade. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, Europe did ban the pre-harvest use of glyphosate. And that means that all, for instance, durum wheat coming from Canada going into the European Union, mainly to Italy, will most probably be tested. And at least in the contracts, I'm sure they will try to be able to tick off the box where it says no use of uh, pre-harvest. Mm-hmm. So, yes, what happens over in the EU will also have, at a certain stage, some implication also down to the farm level here in Canada. So what... Uh What's driving this, and what have farm groups done to respond, or, or maybe, maybe there's a lesson to be learned in terms of what should have been done in terms of farm groups responding to, to the pressure to restrict these tool, what's in the toolbox? Yeah, I would say so too. I think that uh, the farm group should have seen it maybe earlier on. I mean, we did respond. We did see that something was moving and all of this, but we could also, how would I say, we were a bit too slow maybe to react and to tell out to the big public what we are doing today. I mean, yes, we are an old profession, and people tend to keep it as an old profession, but we have to always remind people that we are not old-fashioned. We are using all the modern tools available and all of these, and we have a quite high training grade. I mean, we are professionals in what we do in Europe, and we maybe have missed out a little bit on telling this to the big public, also the legislators and all of these, what has happened inside the last 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, five years on the technological side in agriculture, where we go in then from both hardware, software, down to chemistry and all of these, and at the same time how we are using this. So I think that there we missed out. We should have been more proactive telling the big groups that we are using technology. I mean, sprayers are not the same as they were already just in the beginning of the 90s. We are 2000. 15, 16, we are 17, we are 18, almost 2020. The tremendous leaps already in technology. I mean, we have new nozzle technology. We have much more of low dosage systems in place. We need the toolbox to be able to cope with the change that is happening now in the environment. We get more and more pressure from pests coming in to new regions, to new areas, specialized ones. We also can monitor better nowadays, and that means that we need a more comprehensive toolbox in place to take care of just exactly that small thing. If it is a disease or a new weed or pests, 
we need to have a toolbox. And I think that this is one of the things that we have not been able to communicate. I mean, nobody is, is working just with some old, you know, MS-DOS anymore in the computer system. Why should we then use technology in many people's mind from the 80s and we are in the 2000s? So we have moved there. There we have not been able to communicate most probably well enough. And I think here is the first thing. So are you optimistic, though, that uh, the momentum that that uh, you could describe the anti-scientific side has can be slowed down or that the, the tide can be turned in terms of giving farmers access to tools in Europe? Yeah, that's a very good question because in Europe there is like an, some kind of an anti-science wind have been blowing these last years and our legislation in Europe is based on science, science based on all these, that's how it should be. We need as farmers as well to trust the stuff and the things that are put in market that we will be using and we trust the science in it and now suddenly it looks like a lot of legislation that we see being put in place or like we say being scrutinized by the bigger groups if it is the NGOs or even the legislators are actually basing a lot of their things uh, on something else than science. It has politics. become a politics, yeah. political thing out of the whole thing and that is never good. What do you then do? because the legislation is based on science and you're still legislating things just through the political way. And we feel, at least for the farming sector, that wait a second, this is not right. And we are for sure trying to be there in the middle to explain and try to see what needs to be done. For instance, just the ban of neonics, there was no real socioeconomic uh, impact assessment done to see what kind of an impact will it have on farm income, on the chain, how much revenue will be lost if this is being put in place. And it is a tremendous hit to the European oilseed sector, to the farming sector. At the same time, you see that the also legislation is bringing in that you have to grow more crops on the holdings to fulfill your CAP plants and all of these. That means that you are more harder and harder to find these crops that you would safely be able to grow and also be able to harvest and be able to sell it at quantity but also high quality into the market to be able to get farm income. So it has become a little bit of a vicious circle today. And that's what we need as farming organizations, as farmers today, as mill, I mean, individual farmers should also tell what they're doing, how they are today producing different types of crops, how these things might affect their life, their family's life. I mean, our production unit is the field. It's the, the land that we have. We try to keep it in the best shape as possible to be able to pass it to the next generation. We are not either there trying to just grab everything out of it and then just leave it. No, there is a continuity. A lot of farming places and farms and all this has gone from generation to the generation to the next generation. And we tend to do that. Everybody likes to eat. Everybody yeah. needs to eat at least once a day. At least once a day. Everybody likes lots of food and high quality food. Yes. And we try to be, make sure that this kind of a material, raw material into the fee, food and the feed industry will stay at high quality, safe and good for the consumers. And uh, today it's getting harder and harder to do it. And then at the same time, we see that the trade is opening up and we can see that the certain pesticides or chemicals that are banned to be used by farmers in Europe can be used elsewhere and they can still be freely brought in. So you also see that there, we are now starting to look in and say, wait a second, do we also have to start to look at what is being brought into Europe? And we know already that some of the millers and all of these will look into if, for instance, wheat brought in to Europe have been pre-harvest sprayed with glyphosate and all of these. So it is already getting there. So you see that it's not only to the European farmer this will have an implication, but it will also spread elsewhere into our trading partners, and the more and the more we open up the markets as happening today, it will just spread more and more. So farmers all over the world will feel certain pressure coming out from all the different regions, depending on what kind of positions they take when it comes to plant protection products. So finally then, Max, what do you think it'll take to remove the, the politics or, or get people to go back to watching the science and, and analyzing the, the science when it comes to to crop protection products in, in Europe. Is it going to take a, a crisis, either environmentally or, or in terms of food supply, or, or will I the tide turn? 
It's a, I think that that's a million dollar question. Yeah. And if I can give you a straight answer into this, I would love to be able to do it. But I think that there are a few things that uh, I believe will be driving this. One, we are experiencing a change in the environment, in the climate. We are seeing that there are being more and more of, of very heavy weather events coming in, not only from rains, droughts and all these, but also from new diseases, new pests coming into crop side, new insects coming in and all of these. That will already make it harder and harder to be able to obtain certain products in certain quantity and certain quality and all of these. And this will start to open the eyes also of the bigger mass of people when suddenly the yellow fields are missing from the scenery and all of these. So you will get these soft values that people start to think, but wait a second, why is this not anymore on the shelf? Why is it not European? So I think that's the first thing. So these kind of a soft values will start to play in. But also say that people start more and more to understand that science has always been a part of agriculture, always. It's not something that was invented here now by the big ones, big companies. No, it has always been. They always try to be better and all of these. And people most probably will start to understand that also this very old profession needs to be able to move up back into the 21st century as fast as the rest of the society. Because otherwise we will see more and more people leaving it. There will be less and less production inside the regions that will have an effect also, not only on the farming community, but in the full community as well. And I believe that then they will also start to see that, wait a second, but we had a solution before. Science was there. We could rely on it. And most probably we will go back. And I think that one thing that could be there a trigger is that we need, should think about, have we done the right thing by removing funding from this public research side that could then be used for everybody that was considered more, let's say, neutral. It was also very wide. It also created jobs as well. If we would get this back, I have a feeling that that information would most probably satisfy more certain groups of people and the big mass to understand, yes, we actually need this. So I think that this is the way to go, but that means that we as farmers also have to educate people and tell what we are doing so that they also start to see that, wait a second, you are a farmer, you are also an entrepreneur, you're supposed to be able to live out of your holding, out of the land that you are growing. All right. Well, we're definitely watching what's happening in Europe from here in North America. Thanks for taking the time, Max. Thank you.